How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Greetings and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, I want to talk about China. Yes, we do talk about China a bit on the program, but uh, there are a number of pieces out that are worth talking about regarding China uh, that I I really do think need to be put on your radar because they're significant in what's going on. Uh, But I want to start again from the premise I've, I've told you about earlier where I actually think that our prevailing elite in the country are wrong about China because a lot of the people in the country at the elite level look at China and they think China is on the rise. They think that China is going to be the next dominant country, that the age of China is upon us. And and that shapes so much of the thinking at a bipartisan level in Washington, D.C., You can feel it, can't you? And it is a feeling. It's a perception. You don't have the data right in front of you, but you know it. You get the sense that in Washington and New York, in the finance capitals and in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, there are a lot of people who they think the gig is up. The good days are over. So let's cash in and get out and suck up to China to protect ourselves, suck up to Xi. They're communists, therefore. we we, we got to make friends with them. Elon Musk, for all of his talk about freedom and the like, is sucking up to China. Apple's in bed with them. They're trying to diversify as quickly as they can to India and Vietnam and Brazil and elsewhere, but they're still in China. Disney is deeply concerned about what China thinks about it because it wants access to the box office. Nike, of course, uh, has been using the Chinese sweatshops for years to make its products. They turn a blind eye to China. Institutions of higher education get the Confucius Institutes funded by the Chinese to spread Chinese propaganda. American kids get on TikTok, the Chinese surveillance app that does cutesy ads during Republican debates to try to make it seem innocuous and useful and helpful and friendly when it's a Chinese surveillance app. And in Washington and New York, the bankers, the financiers, the investors, they look at China and they think we can do business there. We can do a lot of business in China. Look at all the untapped resources of China. We can make a killing there. And in Washington, at the one side of the mouth, the leadership of both parties says, China's bad, we got to do something. And out of the other side of their mouth, they're like, hey, China, here's my bank account if you want to send me some money. The elite have gotten a lot wrong in the last decade. And one of the problems is that we're not dealing with the old elite of the country. They were not perfect people. But it's like in business. You know, third-generation companies, family-run companies, are very likely to fail. When the grandkids take over, that's all they've known. They don't really have any idea of what it's like to be without. They make bad decisions. They run the business into the ground. It's common. Uh, When I was a lawyer, I worked with a partner at my law firm who uh, represented a lot of businesses that were family-run enterprises and – He never wanted to work with the grandkids. When the grandkids took over, he ended the relationship. He said it was never, never a good thing. It was always a hassle. We're kind of like with the elites now. Uh, The post-World War II elite who had a vision of the horrors of war, 
set up this country after the war in such a way to be the dominant leader of the world in freedom and free markets and Western democracies. Their ideological heirs took over, but now it's the grandkids, and, and they don't value it. They think that whiteness is, is inherently a sign of systemic racism in the country, and, and we need to study whiteness and, and how bad it is, and, and we're a colonizer, and we've colonized the world, and we're bad. The, the grandkids are always the screw-ups. And they look at China and they've calculated that our time is up. We're a bad country. We're bad people. We're, we deserve it. We've got it coming. We've gotten lazy. We're, 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 our markets are bad. They're bad for people. We've got income inequality. It's, it's terrible. We're systemically racist. It's bad. Let's play nice with China. They're on the rise. And they've got it wrong. They've always gotten it wrong. China's on decline. China is declining. For the first time ever, there were more deaths than births in China in the last year. Think about that. A nation of a billion people for the first time ever in documented, recorded modern history at least. More Chinese people died than were born. Their population is dying off. They don't have enough girls. They got a bunch of angry young men. The country is destabilizing. And now there's this from Politico. The headline is China's Xi goes full Stalin with purge. Something is rotten in the imperial court of Chairman Xi Jinping. While the world is distracted by war in the Middle East and Ukraine, a Stalin-like purge is sweeping through China's ultra-secretive political system with profound implications for the global economy and even the prospects for peace in the region. The signals emanating from Beijing are unmistakable, even as China's security services have ramped up repression to totalitarian levels, making it almost impossible to know what really is happening inside the country. The unexplained disappearance and removal of China's foreign and defense ministers, both Xi loyalists who were hand-picked and elevated, mere months before they went missing earlier this year are just two examples. Other high-profile victims include the generals in charge of China's nuclear weapons program and some of the most senior officials overseeing the Chinese financial sector. Several of these former Xiaokalites have apparently died in custody. Another ominous sign is the untimely death of Li Qijing, China's recently retired prime minister, number two in the Chinese communist hierarchy, who supposedly died of a heart attack in a swimming pool in Shanghai in late October, despite enjoying some of the world's best medical care. Following his death, Xi ordered public mourning for his former rival to be heavily curtailed. In the minds of many in China, heart attack in a swimming pool has the same connotation that falling out of a window does for Russian apparatchiks who anger or offend Vladimir Putin. Since his reign began in 2012, Xi Jinping's endless purges have removed millions of officials. From top-ranking Communist Party tigers down to lowly bureaucratic flies, to use Xi's evocative terminology. What's different today is that the officials being neutralized are not members of the hostile political factions, but loyalists from the inner ring of Xi's own clique, leading to serious questions over the regime's stability. With such a febrile atmosphere in the celestial capital of Beijing, there are fears that an isolated and paranoid Chairman Xi could miscalculate, provoke armed conflict with one of its weaker neighbors, or even launch a full-scale invasion of democratic Taiwan in order to distract from his domestic troubles. The political earthquakes rippling out from the old imperial leadership compound on Zhu Yang Hai are exacerbated. The already dire state of the Chinese economy gets more dire. Chinese financiers and business people are quietly complaining that they're required to spend countless hours studying Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, a painfully turgid governing mantra that boils down to ideology-free totalitarian rule and the return of a personality cult. The banks, the country's leading investment banks, have banned negative macroeconomic or market commentary. Hundreds of senior officials in the People's Liberation Army, as well as thousands of top party officials, have been arrested, disappeared, or suicided, driven to commit suicide or killed to make it look like suicide. The beneficiary are provincial bureaucrats who've worked with Xi earlier in his career who are yes-men, not qualified. That is from Politico. And then there's this from National Review, Jack Butler. 
praise of China's handling of COVID tended to downplay its totalitarian methods. Likewise, praise of China's resistance to decadence has tended to ignore evidence of China's own decadence, as well as evidence of how the government has contributed or failed to arrest it. In September, Nicholas Pompella wrote in National Review a decisive rebuttal to the notion that the CCP was uniquely resisting cultural rot, recounting, among other things, high rates of divorce and declining rates of marriage, the anime of China's youth, the lingering consequences of the Chinese Communist Party's one-child policy, and a culture of listless compliance that is one of the main things holding society together despite it having an abyss at its center. Pompeo concluded that China has its own cultural crisis of decadence and nihilism, and it's worse than ours. The data from China suggests the theme. For the first time last year, the Chinese government acknowledged more deaths than births, marking the first year of decline in population since the catastrophic famine of the early 1960s with Mao. We've got plenty of problems, but the Chinese have bigger problems. And then there's that thing about all communist regimes. In communist regimes, the whistleblowers die In communist regimes, the whistleblowers disappear. So when there are problems, no one blows the whistle. There's a story I want to talk about when we come back, that the United States has the money to build a larger Navy, but we don't have the capacity to do it. It's a problem. I mentioned it a little bit at the end of yesterday's show. I want to spend a little more time with them, let it breathe. But even in that story, they reference China's massive naval buildup, that it is, it's massive, the Chinese naval buildup. The Chinese naval buildup looks like ours at the beginning of World War II as we just started spitting out ships every day. But as those Chinese ships go to sea, they catch fire, they break apart, they sink. The whistleblowers can't blow the whistle because they'll be the ones to get blamed. It's a fundamental underlying weakness of all communist regimes. The Soviets had it. The North Koreans have it. The Cubans have had it. The Chinese have it. When the whistleblowers blow the whistle, they get their brains blown out. Inefficiencies creep in. It's happening in China. Xi Jinping is purging competence for yes men. The population is in decline. The rich are packing up as best they can and leaving and taking their money with them to get out before more purges come. The entrepreneurs are being punished and regressed and not developing the economy. Local governments have involved themselves in such ways, fraud, greed, corruption, bad business deals. The federal national government in China has to bail them out. They're headed into depression. Their country is not just in economic decline, but economic depression. Prices are falling, which you don't want to happen. You want to slow the rate of inflation and hold it steady as best you can. But collapsing prices actually are bad for an economy, really bad for an economy, and it's happening in China. All of the data suggests China is way weaker and more vulnerable than we are told in this country, and yet the elite in this country are convinced that they need to suck up to China. No, no, we don't need to suck up to China. We need to exploit the weaknesses of China. They are exploiting our weaknesses and we have them. They're exploiting technology loopholes. They're exploiting viruses. They're exploiting hackers to come into this country. We've digitized so much of this country and China has not. We're vulnerable to them, but China is vulnerable to demography and money and the destiny of every communist regime on the planet. And the only people in this universe who seem to not realize it are the Western elite, the descended heirs of those who got us through World War II, who now have decided that Western culture is bad, and they flirt with China. And we need to purge them and bring back the free market thinkers of the West to realize we can actually take on China. We have the wherewithal, the means, the capacity, the money to do it. But we got to get rid of our idiot elite to make everybody realize it's possible. Guys, if you're a small, mid-sized business, you're struggling with HR issues, you have employees not showing up, or you got to do a termination, you need onboarding of employees, maybe there's a sexual harassment complaint, you want an HR manager, you don't want to be the bad guy with your employees, Bambi can play the role of HR for you, $99 a month, available by phone, email, real-time chat, 
They do onboardings, terminations. They help your team members get to peak performance. And your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations, regardless of which state. They're great. Now, they're U.S.-based. They, you got somebody to talk to who's dedicated to your team. They give you access to HR expertise, and they add personal touches. So even though they're outsourced by your company, they really feel like they're a part of your team. That matters. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Eric Erickson under podcast. When you sign up, it'll help my show. Bambi.com, B-A-M-B-E-E.com, Bambi.com, Eric Erickson in the podcast tab. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number 877-973-7425. I I freely confess some of you think it's a vice. I like Apple products. I like them so much more than than Android Google products and their green chat bubbles and and just uh there's integration of the platform. So my neighbor his wife's a computer programmer. They got a Google Android household. He bought himself an iPhone. It has not gone over well. Then he confessed he also bought an iPad. Hasn't gone over well. (laughs) Well, Apple, I I, I like the integration of the platform. I like the security, the end-to-end encryption. So here's the thing. Uh, In in the Apple universe, the blue chat bubbles, they're, they're over Apple's uh, proprietary iMessage system, and they're encrypted end-to-end. So if you get a blue chat bubble on an Apple device, it means they're completely encrypted uh, from beginning to end of transmission. So, for example, the government or hackers or anybody else can't read your Apple messages, unlike the ones on Google's platform. Well, Apple is confirming now for the very first time that foreign governments have been carrying out what has been described as push notification spying, saying the company had been legally prohibited by the government from disclosing the practice. Governments have been serving both Apple and Google with secret legal orders to hand over details of the push notifications sent to iPhones and Android smartphones. The privacy came to light after Senator Ron Wyden, a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, received a tip and decided to investigate. In his letter, To Merrick Garland, he writes, in the spring of 2022, my office received a tip that government agencies in foreign countries were demanding smartphone push notification records from Google and Apple. My staff has been investigating this tip for the past year. Push notifications aren't sent directly from the app providers to users. Smartphones, instead, they pass through a kind of digital post office run by the phone's operating system provider for iPhone services provided by Apple's push notification service. For Google, it's Google's Firebase cloud messaging. The services ensure timely and efficient delivery of notifications, which means that Google and Apple serve as intermediaries with all the other information the companies store for or about their users. Because of the push notification data, they can be compelled by governments to hand over the information, and that appears to be what governments have been doing. Apple now has a massive, massive report they have pushed out on transparency and how many hacking attempts often by governments uh, have been involved. It's it's kind of disturbing. I'll get to it. But right now i got to get to Swiss America and them trying to help you save some money. I mean, all the government's up to all sorts of things. Did you hear Ron DeSantis in the debate last night talking about the central bank cryptocurrency project that's been working its way through the Fed? They want to go after your cash, and they want to control it. Swiss America wants to help you protect your hard-earned assets. You can get their secret war on cash report for free by calling or texting 800-289-2646. The all-out war on cash includes digital forms of currency. It's spreading daily, so read the secret war on cash free to my listeners. All you do is mention Eric Erickson. You call or text 800-289-2646. Mention Eric Erickson, 800-289-2646. You can also go to SwissAmerica.com slash Eric. That's SwissAmerica.com slash E-R-I-C-K. Or call them or text them my name, Eric Erickson, to 800-289-2646. Get their free report, The Secret War on Cash. Message and data rates may apply. 800-289-2646. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, delighted to have you with me. In fact, I'm going to go take Larry's phone call. Larry, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing fine, Eric. I I really enjoy your show. Thank you. uh, 
I wanted you to expound on a on a Twitter uh, a tweet that you did last night about how you thought Megyn Kelly uh, deserved her own show on a on a network on a news network. Mm-hmm. I, I look. I I think she does. Uh, she came across of the three moderators. Uh, you had um, it, it Elena Goldman from the Washington Free Beacon. You had Elizabeth Fargus from News Nation, who used to be at at ABC, uh, and, and Megyn Kelly. And I just Megyn Kelly came across as very personable, as she tends to in her podcast. Uh, was willing to ask questions, but she came across as very natural. Um, in her delivery of questions, in her trying to keep people on time, in going to break. Uh, and, of course, that's what she did on TV. And I just – I thought, you know, this – she is a presence. Or she's got a huge podcast following. She's on Sirius XM. But uh, you could drop her into prime time on any network, and that network would get ratings. People would come see Megyn Kelly. It, it makes sense to put her back on TV from a business perspective. Well, she does. It seems like she does really does her homework. And when she has guests on her podcast, they really get into really meaty subjects. Right. And so I've always I've always been impressed. With Megyn Kelly, yeah. I, so I have uh, I've been on her show a couple of times, and it's hard sometimes for me to be on her show because it, she is live at the same time I'm live, and I've got to figure out ways to schedule around it, which makes it difficult. So I've been on a couple times this year, and her questions are always great. Um, she's probative in her questions. She clearly has done her homework ahead of time. She's a good investigative journalist. People forget she's a, a lawyer by training. Uh, she actually she tells the story about how she worked at a law firm in New York City. Uh, it was in one of the big buildings in New York City, and she worked 80, 100 hours a week uh, working at this law firm as an associate, and one day someone stole her purse. In the law firm, in the offices, somebody stole her purse. And at that point, it's like the switch flipped that she realized that this company did not care one whit about her at all, uh, and it was time for her to go. And you know what's so funny is is I had an experience like that when I was a, a young lawyer, and I was working at a small law firm. Uh, I guess there were maybe 20 or so at the time. It's kind of funny. i got a buddy of mine listening right now, and he, he probably won't remember this. I But it was my first year, and it was my wisdom tooth. If you all have heard my famous wisdom tooth extraction story where I got a massive infection in my jaw, and I missed a whole week of work. And I came back into work at the next week. And there were maybe three people in the entire office that even knew I was gone. I was like, I took those people brownies all the time. I, nobody knew I was even gone. They're like, like, what's going on? It's like, I've been out. You look like you've lost some weight. Well, I've been gone for a week and my mouth swollen shut. I can't eat anything. People had no idea. I just, I don't know. To this day, it, it still makes me chuckle. Like, I could have, like died and I don't know that most people at that, that place would it was it was I, I love the people a lot of the people I work with but it was a it was kind of weird. Um but she her purse was stolen. She's in like a skyscraper in New York City and someone steals her purse. And she's like these people really don't care about me, do they? And that was the beginning of the end of her legal career and transition to the media. Uh, I just I think she'd be great on TV. I really do. I mean she was great on TV. She had a great show. Uh, she and I went after each other one time on on her TV show. I was uh, with Lou Dobbs, and she was she was very offended by a conversation Lou Dobbs and I had had. And that's about you know one parent being home and actually, is, and I still stand by the remark. But um, we found some common ground about uh, bread makers and and whatnot. So Lou Dobbs and I had this conversation. We were talking about um, women being home with kids, and actually historically, that's the way it happened. And I, she misunderstood me. I was talking about a parent at home, not necessarily the mom. But uh, all of the economic data, the wellness data out there does show that a two-parent heterosexual nuclear household does better raising kids than any other household, and that if you boil it down of the kids within those two-parent households who outperforms the other, it's a parent who stays at home, and it doesn't matter whether it's the mom or the dad. And Lou Dobbs was very much got to be the mom. The mom needs to stay home, give up her career and stuff. I was like, I don't care. One of them should just be home more than the other. And anyway, she, she so we had this conversation. It was a very funny conversation. Lou Dobbs was oh, he was indignant. Um, 
and, and Megan was, was chastising us, and I thought it was very funny. And so I got up the next morning and was making my kids my cinnamon roll recipe. I'm kneading dough and letting it rise and makes it. And so I sent her a picture. It's like six, six o'clock Saturday morning, and I text her a picture and say, "See, I am the breadwinner in this house." <laughs> We've gotten along ever since. We we share a a sense of humor. Um, I just I think she's great, and I think she asks good questions, and I think that her uh, ability to be personable with powerful people matters a lot. And she's been through the ringer. She lost the show on NBC. She interviewed Alex Jones, which was a big no no. She didn't care. She wanted to ask him. Uh, and she wanted to ask him some tough questions, and she did. But people didn't care about the caliber of the questions she asked. They cared that she dared to ask him questions. And NBC threw in the towel. They never should have. But then part of the problem is with NBC is they don't know how to manage conservative talent. Like, for example, um, so I was at CNN for three years. Then I moved to Fox News for five years. And at Fox, I was rarely ever on TV and and honestly, I mean, I do kind of think Roger Ailes' his business model was you hire up every conservative so they can't go on the other networks, and then you say those networks aren't conservative because they don't have conservative voices. And that was part of it. I would come on occasionally. Fox and Friends had me on. Fox and Friends still has me on on occasion. But by and large, um, the network kind of shelved me, and and part of that was, if I'm honest about it, I did not support Mitch McConnell in 2014. He was running for re-election, and I supported Matt Bevan, who went on to become governor. And I very aggressively helped Matt Bevan in his race. And Mitch McConnell was Roger Ailes' first political client back in the 80s. And Mitch McConnell's wife sat on the board of Fox News. So I got a call from one of the senior executives at Fox News shortly after I had gotten to Fox, who said... If you continue down this path, you will not be put. You will not be given airtime. Oh, I didn't care. I was getting paid a lot of money, and the idea that I could get paid a lot of money and not have to do my job, okay. So, <laughs> I mean, and I wasn't going to back down on McConnell. I, I I didn't think he was good, so I got taken off the air. But I got Fox was the only place I've ever worked where I got paid every single week. I got paid. Rain or shine, every Friday I got a paycheck in the in a deposited to my account. It was remarkable. It's it's the only business I've ever worked with that did that. And I've been told by several people there that they changed it a year or so ago. Now it's biweekly now instead of weekly there too. But what I found at Fox is that they didn't have a problem managing conservatives, although the social conservatives Fox does have a problem with. Like, for example, Fox News has not highlighted uh, the transgender issue with uh, Nikki Haley and Chris Christie. Fox News has Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn Jenner, as a voice on air, and Fox News' diversity training is big on understanding transgenderism and stuff. Fox is bad on the issue. I mean, at the end of the day, they're they're not a socially conservative company, and a lot of the leadership there leans to the left, even as they put on a conservative news product. They do a lot of research. But at CNN, I still have very good relationships with a lot of the people at CNN, and I think highly of the network. But I was very clearly a minority at CNN. When CNN, when I was there, it was still dominated out of Atlanta. They've now pretty much shut down Atlanta. They do some stuff there, but everything's in New York and D.C. When I was at Fox, I could walk down the hallway and someone would see me and say hello and I like what you wrote this morning at Red State or The Resurgent or wherever I wrote it. At CNN, they would literally come up to you in the hallway and quarter you and whisper, I'm a fan. I mean, being in Atlanta as well, and at the time had an Atlanta radio show, I would have people come up to me at CNN and literally they would look around as if they were about to sell me drugs or something and they, they would say, man, I listen to your radio show every day. I'm a fan. But they would whisper it like that because we all knew we were the minority there. I was critiqued for, I mean, I'm a, 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 a Southern dude who did not wear V-neck T-shirts at the time. And and they're like, oh, you, you don't look like you're from New York. That was a problem. Or I, I would say something on Twitter that every conservative America would agree with, but it would be offensive to someone at CNN. And I'd get called on the carpet. In fact, I, I'll be honest with you. So... 
when CNN and Fox were both looking at me originally, Rush Limbaugh was a good friend, and Joe Scarborough from uh, MSNBC, he was a friend as well. And, and I reached out to both of them, and they both gave me the same advice, Joe and Rush. And I figure if Joe and Rush are giving me the exact same advice, I should take their advice. And that was from both of them, go to CNN, and they used basically the same analogy. That if I went to Fox, it'd be like being a suburban Dallas preacher where everyone gave me amens. It didn't matter what my sermon was. It didn't matter what I said. They'd give me amens. But if I went to CNN, it would be like I was a missionary in Africa where nine out of ten things were trying to kill me. And it would make me better at my job to go to a network where everyone was hostile to me and learn how to articulate my positions without compromise, but to be able to articulate them in a way that would make it through the censors and get on television. And it really, it helped my career. It it really did. I learned how to say the things I believe without nuancing the things I believe and to say them in a way that I could say them without losing my job. So I can talk about a transgender issue, and it sure does make the people at Media Matters and elsewhere mad, but I can say it in a way that is not just brash, a biblical donkey style in a way that that causes me trouble with the network. But I will tell you, the reason I went to Fox was not the money. Um, They paid me more money to go to Fox. Roger Ailes wanted to get me out of CNN, and he was willing to write a very big check to do it. And at a time, I was one of the most well-paid contributors at Fox uh, for a year or two while they moved me out of CNN because they had to to get me out of my CNN contract. But I would have stayed at CNN for less money. I enjoyed the people. I liked the challenge of getting on a network where it was uh, three against one all the time. It was me versus a progressive host and probably two progressives, one of whom was called a moderate. The problem was I wanted it in my contract that they would not discipline me for anything I said on radio nor anything other people wrote on my website because people would write stuff on my website and I would get in trouble at CNN for the views that other people shared on my website that I was the editor of at the time, Red State. And they wouldn't do it. And they're like, oh, Jeff Zucker's coming on board. Uh, Jeff Jeff will like it. You you can trust us. We're not going to put it in writing. It's like, well, if I can trust you, you should be able to put it in writing. I didn't have an agent. I did my own negotiations. And they didn't want to put it in writing. And Roger Ailes like, I'll put it in writing. So it's like, done, sold. I jumped, I jumped to Fox. And um, it, it was it was good. It was it was a timely move. I needed to make the move. I'm I now freelance. I don't get paid. I do CNN. I do Fox. I do News Nation. I do HBO. I do NBC, ABC, CBS, and I can go where I want. And I have because I'm not paid. I have the power to say no. And I don't want to do your TV show on a Friday night. I'm sorry. I want to be with my family. And I don't want to do your TV show on the weekend during the holidays. And I can say no. And it's great. But I did learn a lot at CNN. And I'm really glad I haven't been there in the Trump era because they are obsessed, obsessed with Trump. And I know it's because of the ratings. I know it's the ratings. But I'm like, can you go just a day without bringing Donald Trump up? No, you can't because he mentioning him brings ratings. And I get that. But it's just not relevant to the day-to-day lives of people. It is amazing that any news network could be more obsessed with a candidate for president than the actual president of the United States himself. And yet that's where we are so much with these networks now. That is a very long way of saying CNN should honestly, if they want to improve their ratings, give Megyn Kelly a primetime TV show. Put her in at night. I think she would generate ratings. And she'd be good, but you would have to leave her alone and let her do what she does. And you get the ratings and you get the condemnation of progressives, horrified that you put a Megyn Kelly on CNN. But if you want even a competitive advantage against Fox News, you would put Megyn Kelly on. And the fact that the networks won't does tell you how much ideology still drives the views of so many of the networks. When you've got a talent like that who they could put on tomorrow and be guaranteed great ratings, and they won't do it because she is not of their tribe. That, my friends, tells you everything you need to know about the American press corps. All right. Speaking of the obsession with Trump, I I just I got at the end here, Axios, the left-leaning news site, has this, let me just read you this paragraph. Some of it I I think is is just kind of kind of silly, but 
former President Trump, if elected, would build a cabinet and White House staff based mainly on two imperatives, pre-vetted loyalty to him and a commitment to stretch legal and governance boundaries. Sources who talk often with the leading GOP presidential candidate tell Axios. Trump and his prospective top officials don't mince words about their plans. They want to target and jail critics, including government officials and journalists, deport undocumented immigrants or put them in detainment camps, and unleash the military to target drug cartels in Mexico or possibly crack down on criminals or protests at home. They want to scrap rules that limit their ability to purge government workers deemed disloyal. Y'all, the Biden administration is already doing this stuff. The Federal Trade Commission is being sued for violating its purviews and powers and stretching itself. The FCC, the FDA, the Education Department, Homeland Security, all Biden staffs per, people who are progressive to the or loyal to the progressive cause. Trump's doing it to people who are loyal to Trump. Biden's putting in ideological warriors who want to push the boundaries of the office and want to push the boundaries of statute and regulation. This is just turnabout is fair play. I'm, I'm sorry, you may not like Trump doing it, but if you don't like Trump doing it, then well, you should be appalled that the Biden administration is doing it. The Justice Department has ha- hauled pro-lifers out of their homes by gunpoint for being pro-life activists protesting at abortion clinics. Turnabout is fair play. You don't like it. You shouldn't have set the precedence. You can be concerned about it, but you said Jack when the Biden administration and the Obama administration did it. The Obama administration was coming after reporters for leaks out of the Obama administration. All Trump's doing is building on those precedents. You were fine with the precedents when the Democrats set them. Now you got to live with it with the Republicans doing it. You don't like it. That's okay. It's just, it, it's remarkable to me. Trump hasn't settled on specific roles for sp- specific figures and hates it when his staff and friends speculate. It's not in his DNA to do detailed personnel planning, and a lot depends on the f- last few people he's talked to. But in rolling conversations with friends and advisors, he's been clear about the type of men, and they're almost all older white men he'd want to serve at his pleasure if he were in second term. We wrote last month about the multi-million dollar effort to vet loyalists for up to 50,000 lower level government jobs in a Trump administration. This is about their potential bosses. It's unclear who would land where, but make no mistake, there are specific prototypes of Trump Republicans who would run his government. This is very different from the early days of his first term where he was restrained by more conventional officials like John Kelly, Jim Mathis, Gary Cohen. This time it's all loyalists and no restraint. It's what the Democrats do when the Democrats are in charge. Y'all just don't care when the Democrats are in charge. Y'all like it when the Democrats staff up progressive warriors like Lena Khan and others. In the administration or Elizabeth Warren under Obama at the uh, what the CFB, whatever. Turnabout's fair play. Y'all can hate it all you want. Interestingly enough, Melania Trump wants Tucker Carlson for VP. Did you ever read the stuff he said about Trump where he literally effing hated the guy? He wrote that in a text message. 